Hi, everybody. Good evening. Welcome. My name is Neil Payton. I am an architect and urban designer with the firm of Torty Gallus and Partners, and our office is in downtown LA. I'm going to introduce our team that's here tonight, and then I'm going to go through a little bit about the order of what's going to happen this evening, uh, so, uh, and ask a couple questions. With me tonight, uh, from other, also from Torty Gallus, is Nicole Cotes, Bettina Sasson in the back, Christy Kwok, and then way in the back, Chaiwat Pilanen, making beautiful drawings. And then joining us by the magic of the internet is one of my business partners, Brandon Diamond, who is on the little computer there, but he exists somewhere. Uh, and he's also working hard. Okay, we're also joined by one of our collaborating team firms, and that is the firm of Consensus. And they help us with the public outreach and messaging and branding and the like. And with and, and leading that team is partner Josh Gertler and his colleague Michelle Sinning. We have many other team members. I'll just tell you who they are. They're not all here tonight. We have the firm of Salt. Uh, and they are landscape architects. We have a firm of Gibson Transportation Company, which is uh, transportation and mobility consulting. We have um, RCL Co, which is a market research and uh, basically telling us what the market says could be done here, economic development, that kind of thing. And then we have Safos Environmental, and they will be working on the EIR for this when there's an EIR to prepare. I think I've got everybody, is that, what's that? Yeah. Oh, and KPFF, those are the civil engineers, so they do all the infrastructure. Uh, and so, that's the team. What we're here tonight to do is talk about the town center of Diamond Bar. This concept, this term, town center, was something that you all adopted when you did the general plan update in, I believe, 2018, I want to say. Is that correct? That was the 2019. Just got it in right before the wire there, before COVID. Um, the, uh, so you identified this 55 acre, 45. 45 acre area as the town center uh, and described it in general terms. This was a kind of an aspiration to make uh, a downtown for Diamond Bar. So that's what we're here tonight doing. Next. And I'm hoping when you walk in the building here, you you know, you, you, you get this, these five panels, and these are the historical events that shaped the formation of Diamond Bar. And perhaps in another 10 years, there will be another panel. And this will be the panel that deals with the making of a town center for downtown. Because I, I hope that this will become an, also an important event in the history of this city, an important idea. Next. Can we maybe dim a little bit of the lights? Uh, same thought. Is that anybody know how to do that? Because it's, I can't see it all that well. And I'm sure others can't either. Is this one of these? Ah, is that okay? You okay with that? Okay, perfect. Well, the first slide was just, you've already, you see it every day when you walk in the building. So. OK. Um, that was just a prompt. So this is the site area we're talking about. We have Diamond Bar Boulevard kind of running through the center of it. The 60 freeway, the 57 freeway, and then Golden Springs Drive in the southeast of the site. Right? You know, there's, there's a Sprouts here. There's a CVS and a Smart and Final. Uh, so I think you all, you're here, so you, I'm pretty sure you know the site. Next. And just some of the aerial views of the site. And uh, well, uh, sorry. <laughs> in some ways, this is a pretty typical suburban, commercial suburban environment. And it's served this city very well for its time period. But it is beginning, beginning to be out of date. 
And the reason is because retail and town centers have moved beyond what we used to call strip shopping centers with surface parking in the front to more walkable, uh, denser environments where people can live and shop, sometimes work in close proximity. Others can come and shop and enjoy being in a, in a place that's a little bit more like some traditional downtowns that maybe you visit at occasionally. But what makes this place different among others is that it has amazing mountain views. So that's pretty special. And there are a couple of spots in particular where on clear days, those mountain views are, are pretty prominent and become uh, kind of an opportunity to focus, focus them, focus on them, and to make something truly unique about this town center. Next. I'm gonna go run through, oh, I wanna ask a question. How many of you were here a month ago for the workshop that we did? Okay, so for, thank you for coming back. For those of you who were here a month ago, you're going to see some of the same slides. And there'll be some new ones. So I don't wanna bore you of the exact same thing. For those who weren't here a month ago, the critical slides are still here. So, you know, in the beginning of the show, when the TV show, when they say previously, uh, so this is previously on the Diamond Bar Town Center presentation. Uh, so we're gonna show, the, the ones that you're not seeing are, don't really need them. Um, one thing you wanna keep in mind is that there is a slope to this site. It slopes about, four, these colors represent like 10 feet of topography. So this site slopes about 4% across from here to there. Now what does 4% mean? If you don't live in that world, 4% is an abstract number. What does it mean? It doesn't sound like that much. Um, 4% is enough so that you feel that you're walking uphill when you walk on a 4% slope. But it's not so steep that it's like, oh my God, what a hill. It's not like your car is gonna roll down the hill or anything. It's not that bad. But it is enough so that you feel it. Now, what does that mean? It means if you're making a shopping center in the old fashioned way, you've gotta sort of flatten the whole site in order to be able to put the buildings on it. Otherwise, they're stepping up and Modern developers don't like to do that. So the result of that, next, is when you kind of flatten the site, is you create a set of pancakes, and some are lower than others. So these red lines, these represent two feet of topography, and when they're all bunched together, you can see that it's a slope. It's pretty steep. So they're about, from here to here, there's about 14 feet of slope. What? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so from one end of the site to the other? Uh, from the northern end of the site to the southern end of the site. Uh, from one boundary of the site to the other, from the northern boundary to the southern boundary. It would be from, the, let's say, the freeway to Golden Springs. Okay, thank you. I didn't know what you meant, but thank you. I understand now. Uh, Golden Springs is, is at the bottom of the, si of the slide here. And the freeway is, see all these, there are a bunch of red lines at the top. This is all the grading that had to be done to create the freeway. So this is, for, this is a drawing we used because it abstracts the site and lets us see it's really hard to build right here. All right, and so we, we um, you know, in a place where there's a lot of red lines, where they've, They've, um, they've graded the site so that it's, you, could, you could ungrade it, so to speak, but that would be a lot of work. Uh, so, moving on. So, when we came to the meeting about a month ago, we came with a tentative list of goals for the site. We created these goals, we had written them, and we asked for comment from the community. And I will say that we had a general gr agreement with these goals. And I'll read them to, for you. Make it a great, make the town center a great neighborhood with a sense of place. All right, make the design and the programming support health and well-being. 
make the place walkable. By the way, that goes hand in hand with health and well-being. Provide for a car light, car optional living. Doesn't mean get rid of the car, it means for those who don't have a car, don't have access to a car, can't use a car, who don't want a car, can't afford a car, or otherwise just would like to get around on something other than a car, it's also convenient. Make great public spaces, so that means parks, plazas, and what we're calling regenerative landscapes. And then accommodate a range of densities and housing types and levels of affordability. Recognizing that as your children grow up and they may want to continue to live in Diamond Bar, they need a place to do that. That's within their budget. Or as you grow older and decide you no longer want a house, that there might be opportunities for you to stay in Diamond Bar and have a, live in a walkable community uh, in, a, in a type of living that meets your, your needs. Provide for flexibility for the future, particularly for the retail and commercial spaces. And the reason that is so, so important is because we cannot predict what the future will hold, particularly in the retail and commercial world. In two and a half years ago, if I said to you, you know what, Retail is going to get crushed in the next two years because we're all going to be home sitting around with the virus, and you would have never believed that, ever. So the thing is that no one can predict these things, and when retail or when any kind of physical design is so specifically designed for one thing only, it's really hard to make a place that lasts for 100 years. And the places that we all love that are historic all the buildings have changed uses over time, changed all kinds of things over time. And so we need to have that level of flexibility. And then most importantly, to be developable in phases. This will not happen tomorrow. There are a number of reasons for that. One is we couldn't absorb it all. But secondly, and you'll see that in a minute, we've got 23 separate property owners in these 45 acres. There's a lot of property owners for such a small area. And each one of them has their own, you know, thing. They want to do what they want to do. And so getting folks to cooperate, work together, that, having a plan that will work even if you only do part of it, but then five years later you can do another part of it, that's a really critical thing. Next. So we, we talked about all those goals. And, you know, we, didn't, we got a lot of comments, but there wasn't a huge amount of pushback from that. In fact, there was no pushback. In fact, there was a lot of support for that. Um, we then gave some examples of what do we mean by a great neighbor with a sense of place. And so, you know, we, we looked at a couple of nearby examples, examples that we have heard some folks in this community uh, go to or admire. Um, downtown Pasadena, Claremont Village, Old Town Monrovia, Downtown Brea, four of many other examples that could have been selected. All right, each of these has their own particular characteristics, their own sense of place, if you will. Um, but they all, um, they all are, you might see, not dominated by parking lots. They, they have buildings that form the edges of streets. Uh, they have landscape that supports the sense of place. They have signage, trees, lighting. All of these things combine to create something. Next. So what we did was we actually took the outline of the Diamond Bar Town Center area and we superimposed the outline on several other cities, the ones we just mentioned, just to see if they fit. Or not really they fit because they're all different sizes, but just to see what it might be like. And so we have five images on the screen. Uh, they include downtown Pasadena, downtown Brea, downtown Claremont, downtown Chino Hills, which is really a new kind of shopping area, and downtown Monrovia. And um, I'm sorry, downtown Claremont. Thank you. Um, so each of those kind of superimposed. And we do that not because we're going to somehow 
take one of those and plop it here because we couldn't. But it helps us, it helps you get a sense of scale of how big this place is and what it, you know, what is it like in comparison to other places that you've been. Now, I know when I walk from, let's say, uh, Golden Springs up to the freeway, it seems kind of like a longish walk. But in fact, it's not that much longer than walking end to end in downtown Chino Hills or of uh, the kind of main street. What's the name of that street in Claremont? That's, um, I can't remember the name. Yeah, Indian Hill. That's, um, so it's not that much farther. In fact, it's pretty much the same. So it feels a lot longer because you're mostly walking through parking lots. And the reality is that we, n most of us, do not like walking through parking lots. We put up with it. It's necessary, but we don't enjoy it. Uh, partly because it's hot when in the summer, but also because humans have this um, un characteristic, it's not unusual, but it's a particular characteristic of our evolution, which is that we like to walk along the edges of things. We are an edge-loving species. The term for that, which I don't remember now, it's some Greek word, but uh, it describes animals that are edge-loving. And we are an edge-loving species because we don't have eyes in the back of our head, we don't have antennas, we can't completely see our surroundings, right? We have limited visibility, so we use the edge to help us protect ourselves. Edges in modern world could be buildings, could be landscapes, etc. But if you ever go into a restaurant and there's only a few people in there, you'll probably find yourself sitting near the edge and not the middle, because it just feels more comfortable. So, and this, these observations have been made by folks in my profession for a long, long time. So. Um, it turns out that we like to walk along edges, particularly when there's enough detail on those edges to enrich our senses. So if you walk along, say, in a shopping mall, uh, you know, there's every 30 feet or every 60 feet, there's another store, and it's got stuff in the window, and we look at it, and it's, it's, it's nice. We like to do that. And if, if the store goes out of business, the, the, the owner of the mall will put something in the window just to make it interesting. Because if you have more than like 60 feet of nothingness, you'll get bored and you just won't go. And so we need enough detail in the buildings, in the storefronts, in the entries to buildings uh, to make it interesting, but we also want that edge or at least a landscape edge. That's why walking through a parking lot is not fun. Next. So making a great neighborhood with a sense of place, what does all that mean? Well. We like to think of it as, I'm going to read this, as is the science and the art of bringing together land use, public space or public realm, architecture, and programming, meaning what goes on there, events, centered on people and community in an urbane and walkable form that allows each to maximize its contribution to create a vibrant and beloved destination. So. What does this mean? From an architecture point of view, it can, mean, it can mean character, it can mean building styles and facades, it can mean storefronts. From when they say public realm, we're talking about public art, we're talking about spaces, parks, civic buildings, history. When I talk about land use or program, or a program rather, we're talking about what goes on in the public spaces, what goes on in the private spaces, what kind of institutional uses are there. And from a land use point of view, we're mostly concerned with what goes on on the ground floor, because that's where we are, but, but to a lesser extent what goes on on the upper floors, because that keeps people there. Next. So a place that, to create a sense of place that also promotes health and well-being. Now, the design of the current town center of Diamond Bar much like suburban environments across the United States, at this point across the world, was not designed for health and well-being. Right? It was designed specifically to separate every land use from every other land use so that you needed a car to get anywhere. Now, as a result, 
We Americans suffer extremely high wet rates of chronic illness that are preventable through lifestyle changes because we don't walk enough. Now, we'll spend a lot of money to belong to a gym, we'll drive to the gym and then work out, but if we created a walkable environment, we maybe would save some money on the gym uh, because we could actually walk to places. So, I mean, I don't know how many of you count your steps every day. Some of you, maybe you do 10,000 steps. I rarely get there unless I'm in an environment where I, it's convenient to walk, right? If it's, it's just as convenient to walk as to drive, you'll walk. And I do these all over and everybody always tells me, well, you know, out here we don't like to walk. You know, we like our cars. Everybody loves their cars. Everyone does. Even in New York, they like cars. Right? It's just more convenient to walk there than it is to drive them. And, and what I found, even in LA, in neighborhoods that are designed to walk, and it's convenient to walk, people actually do. Now, some other things will help, like shade, because it's, you know, get, when it gets really hot. But the reality is that 50% of what makes us healthy is our behavior. So, next. So if you have an environment, this is another place, but, uh, and you can tell it's, it's not out west because it's got so many trees in it, but um, you have an environment in which every use is separated from every other use. You get parking lots everywhere, lots and lots and lots of traffic because you have to get in your car to get from here to there. So from one, uh, here to there. From one lot to the next, you gotta get back in your car. In fact, there's even signs that say you can't park here if you're going there, <laughs> right? Which, I mean, it really doesn't make sense, right? I mean, it makes more sense to have your, if you're parked already and you have to walk 100 feet, to just walk 100 feet, even if it's on somebody else's property. That makes sense, but it's not the way we've designed the world. So if you could somehow fill it all in, right, and make buildings and storefronts that framed streets, created edges, right, that we love, and made it comfortable and convenient to walk, as, as much as drive, that is, let's say you drove to the place and then you parked your car and then you could walk everywhere in that place, right? So it's not like you're not going to drive there. Of course you will, unless you live there. But most people in this room will not live there because right? you live somewhere else. Uh, but you can still drive there, park your car, and once your car is parked, then you could walk around all over the place, right? And that's called park once. Actually, that's a term that's used for that. So that's the thing, trying to turn that into that, right? Next. So what are the things that make a place walkable? By the way, I'm, I'm really obsessed with this walking thing because everything else follows from that. Because in a sense, walking is what we humans do. And you know, our bodies are meant to, we were, Another evolutionary characteristic, aside from being edge-loving, is that we're a walking species. Uh, evidence, some archaeological evidence or anthropological evidence suggests that Cro-Magnon man walked somewhere in the neighborhood of nine miles a day. Cro-Magnon woman walked somewhere in the neighborhood of six miles a day. Most of us, I'm sure, don't do that. And yet our bodies actually have evolved for that very purpose. So if we're not use, doing that, but it's not just that it's health, it's also about sociability, it's about meeting your neighbors, it's about, it's about those encounters you have accidentally when you see somebody on the street that you saw five years ago, but oh my God, there they are again. Or maybe it's the person you see every day, you don't even know them, but you recognize their face because they're on the street every day walking and you see them and it's a greeting, hi, how are you? And that's it. And that also helps build a community. So. Okay, what makes a place walkable? Well, first of all, we have different things going on within a close proximity. Like if I live there, I can walk to a shop or a coffee or whatever, right? Um, so different land uses and amenities within walking distance. Connections, easy to move between places. Now, if you walk down Diamond Bar Boulevard today, there are sidewalks there, right? But they're not very nice. They're pretty narrow. A lot of busy traffic going by, right? There are very few people walking on that street. There are a few, but not many. And I guarantee you the people that are walking on that street have no choice. 
They do not have access to a car at that moment, so they have to walk. That shouldn't be the case. It should be a, a nice experience to do that. Now, that's a challenge for a lot of reasons that I'm sure you recognize, but it is a goal. Generous sidewalks and street trees, that's part of making a place walkable. Street trees are really important because they provide shade. That's a fundamental thing. They reduce the heat island effect. You have a nice treed street, temperatures on that street will go down five degrees or more uh, on a summer day, maybe even 10. Plus they add value, huge real estate value. Spatial enclosure, I mentioned that's the edge thing. So feeling like you're in a room when you're even when you're outside. I liken it to the peanut butter jar, the new peanut butter jar. So you open up a peanut butter jar, take the spoon, you take a big scoop out of the peanut butter jar. Some of you are looking at the spoon with the peanut butter. I'm looking at the, what's left in the top of the peanut butter jar. It's the left, it's the spatial enclosure of that. So think about great places as having a certain degree of spatial enclosure. If you ever go to Europe, any of you been to Europe here and here? How many of you have been to European cities? Okay, a lot of you. One of the things that people go to visit Europe for is because the cities there actually, in some cases, feel that way. They feel like little plazas or piazzas or places, places, whatever. They feel like you're in an outdoor room. Intersection density, right, this is a strange one, and these two, last two, I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna give you maps. Here's a surprising thing. The majority of cities that are walkable, or town centers that are walkable, have a high amount of intersection density. Intersections are good for walkability. You might think, well, that seems kind of like intersections have cars, and wouldn't that be the opposite of good? No, it isn't, and I'll tell you why. Because you need to cross the street every now and then. And the more intersections you have, the shorter the distance you have to walk to get to a place where you can cross the street. Another reason is that the more intersections you have, the more streets, that means the less work any one street has to do. Because right now you have a situation where you have one street, Diamond Bar Boulevard, going in that sort of north-south direction, that's take doing a lot of work, partly because there's a freeway entrance. Well, the more, if we can add internal streets that connect through, Little teeny local trips can actually be done not on Diamond Bar Boulevard. And that frees up a little bit of space on Diamond Bar Boulevard. So intersection density is very important to creating a walkable environment. The other thing is to minimize surface parking. Now, parking is convenient. You need some parking. I don't mean to get rid of parking. I mean minimize it on the surface, put it in structures, in buildings. Because all that land operating as surface parking right now, those are big parking lots that you go to, right? Which are dark asphalt and just absorbing heat like you wouldn't believe, right? Um, they also, just as I mentioned before, they're boring, right? So there was this great urban thinker named Christopher Alexander who wrote a book called A Pattern Language. And he identified like a thousand different patterns of great cities. And one of, out of those thousands was, it should be less than 9% of the land area as parking. How he came up with that exact number is debatable, but it should be in that range. So, next. So here's, we did a map of what we thought were the good, bad, and horrible sidewalks. And we found a good sidewalk, one, right there behind on Torito Lane, in front of some townhouses. It's very charming. It's like this little block of really nice townhouses with a sidewalk. Now they front the back of the CVS, which is not so nice. But <laughs> that little moment is like, this is good. This could work fine. You do more of this, you'd be great. And we found some, the orange is, let me say, there's a sidewalk. It's not that nice, but there, at least it exists. And the red, there is literally no sidewalk. So that's what the situation is. Next. So we compared the, those other char those characteristics of intersection density and surface parking area to those other five examples that we talked about earlier. Pasadena, Brea, Claremont, Chino Hills, and Monrovia. So Diamond Bar has an intersection density of 65 intersections per square mile. 
This is in the town center area. 150 is considered about the minimum to make a walkable environment. It's not the greatest environment, but you can get by with 150, okay? Chino Hills is just there. Pasadena is like double that, oh, more than double that, 352. Brea is at 117, so it still has some work to go. Downtown Claremont at 261, and uh, Monrovia at 287. These are the downtown areas. So all of these have pretty high intersection densities, which is one of the things that makes them good, right? So we, you know, that's gotta be improved. Next. And of course, you want generous sidewalks. Now, it doesn't mean they all have to look like Santa Barbara, State Street, though it is quite a good sidewalk, I would say. I mean, look at the amount. I'm going to describe this sidewalk, all right? It's got, it's very wide. It's probably 20-ish feet. It's got people sitting by in cafes, even got a place to park your bike. It's got lots of generous planted landscape, different types of trees. It's got amenities like trash cans and uh, well, at the time this picture was taken, there were newspaper boxes, but they don't really exist anymore. Um, lots of, there's awnings, there's a lot of detail in the buildings, balconies overhanging, signage that overhangs, uh, flag ba banners on the light poles. So different kinds of trees. There's palm trees, but there's also smaller shade trees. All of this, there's a beautiful surface. All of this combines to make a phenomenal sidewalk that people spend oodles of money to visit from all over the world. I mean, they're not just visiting the sidewalk, but honestly, that is a, that is a big deal. They don't even realize it, how much effort went into making that place, and there's a lot of it. And they just, that's great. They don't, they don't have to realize it. This is a very different kind of place. This is a, a literally a pedestrian-only street. It's in Maryland. It's the other side of the country, but it's also a place that has a kind of vibe to it. Very different. Uh, not what I would propose here, but except the idea that it can be, it doesn't even have cars in this case. It's just pedestrians. Next. So here we have some photographs of some of the sidewalks and places in downtown Diamond Bar, or town center of Diamond Bar, a few, few soon to be. And you'll see that we have, uh, you know, we have sidewalks, as I mentioned, this place is actually one place that goes around the trees, kind of interesting. Uh, it's a little bit narrower than I'd like. We have staircases that connect the topography, because remember I mentioned that this is a 14-foot difference between the upper level and the lower because of the grading that was done. So there's a staircase, though. It's not very accessible or visible. I'm going to guess that most of you haven't been on that staircase. Maybe you didn't even know that staircase existed. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, no, it's there. It's, it's, you know, between two of the buildings on that, um, where is it? It's like, all right. Now, personally, I wouldn't take that staircase because it looks kind of remote and desolate and like, who's going to be there? Uh, but, you know, you could have a cool staircase, right? That is a possibility that you could make a great staircase connecting the two. And we'll see some ideas later. Uh, you know, you've got, uh, you know, again, sort of areas that aren't that pleasant to cross because the dimensions are so wide. You do have a bike lane, but it's partly got a, it's partly in the gutter pan, the gutter. So if I'm actually a cyclist here, it's not gonna feel really safe <laughs> to be there, right? now. One, one thing is that you could argue that well, it should be wider or you could say, well, there's no room for it. Let's get rid of it because either way, right now, it's not a good situation. But as you can see, it's not that it's, it's, it's not that a pedestrian can't maneuver here. They can, but they can't maneuver, I would say, graciously. This is not an environment that puts them front and center. This is an environment that permits pedestrians. It allows them to be there but doesn't sort of encourage them. Again, typical of, what? Yes. 
Yes. That's uh, well said. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I Well, it would be it would be difficult for the car to do that there because it's so steep, but they I mean, I don't know what they were thinking when that staircase was built. There was no thought. Yeah, that's possible. <laughs> that's entirely possible. Yeah. That's true. I mean, that was, again, everywhere. It's not unique to Diamond Bar. This, is, this was the way we did things. The car was everything. So next. So we also looked at um, that issue of surface parking, and we compared it to those other five cities that we've been looking at. And again, we do this not to say one is better than another, but it's a nice way to see how, oh, some cities don't have this problem because they've done this. Now, Again, Pasadena comes out with 5% surface parking, which is really great. Now, you might go to Pasadena and have a hard time finding a place to park. That's the downside. And one of the things you're going to hear is it is not easy to solve for both things perfectly. It is not easy to get, in fact, it's impossible. I'm going to say it right now. You will not get a solution that is 100% perfect for cars and 100% perfect for pedestrians. That is not going to happen. You could get one that's 100% for one and horrible for the other. That one's easy. <laughs> the hard part is getting one that's pretty good, very good, pretty good and very good for, for both. Let's say the 70%. You know, because you're going to have to make some sacrifices to get a more pedestrian environment. You're going to have to make some sacrifices with the cars. And if you want to keep the cars moving through, you're going to have to make some sacrifices to the pedestrian. It just is. This is the world we are in. in. But Pasadena's got 5%. Downtown Brea has 20%. So a little bit more, but I, they have room to fill in, so they might get there. Claremont's at about 15%, so it's pretty good. I mean, the 9% is just a guide. It's not like you have to hit that. Uh, Monrovia is at 13%, so that's very good. And then Chino Hills, they've got some work to do. They probably eventually will be built because they're at 31%. They will eventually, I'm guessing, will build some parking garages and fill in some more there. This is a work in progress there, I think. So it's the evolution. And that's, that's kind of phasing. And I'm imagining that that's what will happen here over the long term. Next. So public space, parks and plazas. Now, we only have 45 acres here. So it's not a lot of room for parks and plazas. Uh, and according to LA County standards, Diamond Bar is, uh, sits at about 2.72 acres of park space per thousand residents, which actually, and, and that's actually about, that's lower than uh, LA County average of 3.3, but remember that LA County average includes a lot of areas that are pretty out there, like the Santa Monica Mountains, so I, it's sort of unfair. Um, Brea is much, much higher. But again, that's not really the downtown of Brea, but it is the city as a whole. So Diamond Bar is a little bit light. We're not going to make up the gap here, because even if the entire site was a park, it still wouldn't make up the gap. But you know, I think it's something to keep in mind, that you want to have public space. And that public space could be as simple as you know, a, 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 a plaza with fountains or cafes and um, things like that like we see in uh, Chino Hills or, or Pasadena in these examples. Next. So one of the things we heard um, from, um, we did this, this, this is a, uh, a word cloud. And this comes from some of the uh, things we heard from the last meeting. You know, we broke out into tables and people discussed all this. And there's some things that probably look a little odd here, like concerns. Well, there are people who have lots of concerns. and. They just sort of grouped them, but uh, there was there was some issue. I mean, clearly there was an idea that yeah, if we want a town center, some people talked about movies, lots of restaurants. Some talked about concerns about traffic, right? Of course, there are traffic concerns, and I will tell you that they're still going to be here after. I have never been anywhere that anybody loved that did not have some traffic issues. It just it's like I don't know. Like people love it, people got to get to it, and. There's that. So uh, people talked about bike lanes. And 
some affordable housing. Uh, some people talk about a pedestrian bridge over uh, Diamond Bar Boulevard to connect the two sides. I will tell you that the aspiration of connecting the two sides of Diamond Bar Boulevard is a very good one and important, and we're going to work on that. I will very strongly recommend any sort of pedestrian bridge over that street. The reason is because people don't use pedestrian bridges. They hate them. They, the only way you get people to use them is if you fence the middle of the road to the maximum extent. If you basically say the road is, is in no man's land, so we have to get above it, uh, that's the way, that's the only time they work. People don't like to use them. The elevators always break. Um, it's, they're very expensive. And wouldn't the city be better off spending the money on things that actually make a better street space? So I'm going to say that what this, to me, represents is the aspiration to connect both sides of Diamond Bar Boulevard, but not necessarily with a bridge. Uh, but that's what it, people said. Um, there were lots of other uh, concerns or issues brought up, shared parking, public gathering space. Uh, one group talked about the idea of what's called a road diet on Diamond Bar Boulevard. You know what a road diet is? Yeah. That came up several times. One person suggested, or one group suggested closing it. It's pretty radical. Um, so the one that suggested just removing a lane in each direction seemed tame in comparison. Um, I will say this, we've done a traffic study, and it's not complete yet. You're not gonna, you're gonna find this hard to believe, but the problem you have is not traffic per se, you have two intersections that are problematic. You have an intersection problem, not a traffic problem. Now, it might seem like a distinction without any thing, but it actually, according to the traffic folks, is a big deal. So the question is, can we solve for the intersection problem and also do something about Diamond Bar Boulevard that makes it more pedestrian friendly? Uh, that's not, it's hard. I don't have the answer to that. This is, we're not presenting an answer tonight. We're just starting the problem tonight. So next. So one of, the other, one of the constraints we have is, in addition to Diamond Bar Boulevard being, you know, an issue, uh, and some of the other questions that were raised, is that we have 23 separate landowners. I mentioned that earlier. So, you know, sometimes it looks like this one big shopping center here, right? It's, you got the Sprouts and you got the other stuff that's here, but it's actually not just one landowner, right? And the, the line, the property line, like, goes through the parking lot. You can't see it, but it, they know where it is. The owners know. So every one of these colors represents a different landowner. So uh, the gas station is their own land. The McDonald's is its own site. The water pumping station is its own thing. You know, all of these. So this is a challenge because we're not going to make a town center out of all this confetti unless that confetti decides they want to, like, make some kind of colorful rainbow thing that's, you know, nice, because it's going to just be confetti. Um, you know, I talked about streets connecting and all that. I can't connect things unless the property owners want to connect things, right? So we've talked now to about, I'm going to say, about 18 of the property owners. Uh, a few of them we haven't so spoken with because we can't find them. Um, you might think it's odd that we can't find them. After all, don't they pay their taxes and all that? Yes, they do. It all comes through some account somewhere, and it gets paid. But the city even sent down, in one case, a, um, what do you call a registered letter where you, know, you have to sign for it, and it, it came back un, un, you know, returned to the city. So these people do not want to be found. And this is actually not untypical in these situations. If somebody owns it, they live in wherever. Florida or Colorado, and they just collect their dragon check, and they don't really want to be bothered with this. So it's not, not easy, but we're going to plow through it. And we're working with these landowners to try to think of ways that they can work either collaboratively or separately, but in a way that still connects them together. Right? So that's a challenge. Next. What else are some of the constraints? Well, we've identified that. You know, the big ones are things like Diamond Bar Boulevard being fast, loud, not friendly to pedestrians, a, a kind of a rift. It's almost like it's a zipper, and right now Diamond Bar Boulevard is kind of unzipped, and we want to zip it back together. That's what that is. And then we've got those little steep slopes that are kind of 
difficult, not impossible, but they represent a challenge, not only here, but also along the, uh, not, 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 between Golden Springs, the sites along Golden Springs and the main part of the center, but also closer to um, uh, the, inner, the 50. There's also on the sort of western side of the site, there is a street that comes under the freeway whose name I don't remember at the time. Prospect Park Road. Okay. And it goes right by the site, but which is great, except there's a chain link fence that m makes it impossible to get in. I mean, people actually get through because you can see the damage to the chain link fence. So people cut through and climb over and stuff. But it's not intended that they do that. And so, and yet, wouldn't it be great if there was another way to get here? You know, that would be a, a real home run. So that's a, that's a constraint, but also an opportunity. Next. So some of the opportunities. Well, obviously, there's an opportunity to make a real sense of a center, you know, maybe at the middle of the, between uh, the, the sort of middle of the block here, so to speak, where you enter the main shopping centers on both, on both sides, there is a prospect uh, where those stairs are that afford a fabulous view of the mountains. And what if that would became a place that was really a signature spot that afforded you views of the mountains, but also a kind of way to connect, even if it's by stair sequence and ramp uh, between the southern part of the site and the rest of the site? What if you connected Prospect with the rest? What if you created a grid of streets in what is now the parking lots so that we actually break the size of these blocks down, create more intersections, fill them with buildings and, in some cases, garages that support the part necessary parking for those buildings, to create the feeling of a town center. So those are all, let me say, opportunities. Next. Stairs. We were dreaming, and we thought, well, you know, there are nice stairs out there, urban stairs. And have you been to Rome? A few of you have been to Rome? So this is called the Spanish Steps, so the Piazza di Spagna. And um, it doesn't, usually there's about 100 times more people on the stairs than this. But I wouldn't be able to see the stairs if I had that. So, um, and people sit on the stairs. It's a scene. There's a great fountain at, at the bottom. There's a famous church at the top. Uh, it's an amazing, but really the main thing is the stairs. I mean, the plazas at the bottom of the top are nice, but the stairs are the thing. So the stairs aren't just a way to get from point A to point B, they are the place. Now, this is uh, Paris. It's a little le less grand, but quite compelling, I think, a set of stairs that come down a residential neighborhood. And you can see all of Paris in the distance. But we imagined that you could see the San Gabriel Mountains in the distance, and thought, well, that could be cool, too. So this is actually here in downtown LA, or not here, but in, right here in LA County. This is um, literally our office is two doors, two buildings down. So I walk by this every day. I can tell you there's 110 steps there, because um, I, I do them. Um, and um, there's a fountain that runs down it. This is way more than we need. This is like, what, 30, 40 feet or so. This, we're talking 14, so not a big deal. Uh, but, uh, and the nice, these are nice steps, uh, but they, won't, they don't want you to sit on them because they'll kick you out because, you know, it's loitering. In Rome, it's like considered normal, and here it's loitering, so, well, okay, whatever. Um, and this ends in a street, unfortunately, not a plaza, and at the, up, at the top, it ends in kind of a parking garage entrance, so also not as good, but still, some goodness there. So, you know, what if, right? Next. So then we could also talk about, uh, well, Diamond Bar Boulevard itself. Now, you may know that the city has done what's called a complete streets plan for Diamond Bar Boulevard. You ever heard the term complete streets? Okay, so I'll take you a step back. What is complete streets? It means that a street isn't just for cars. That would be an incomplete street. A complete street includes bicyclists, it includes pedestrians, it considers the feeling of being in that street, so it considers the edges of the buildings along that street, the landscape that goes in that street. It thinks of the street 
not as a conveyor of traffic, but as a public space with, in which traffic, pedestrians, bicyclists, critters of all sorts can run and, 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 and exist with shade and people looking into it from buildings. So that's a complete street. Not every street is gonna be perfect, but that's the concept behind complete streets. So the city's done a complete streets plan and that is the guide that we're using. That guide prov really provides some additional landscape along Diamond Bar Boulevard, it's, it's nice. But we also want to explore slightly more out there things because, you know, why shouldn't, when we should hear, we're being paid to do this, we should try things, right? So I want to say something. If you hear me say, suggest things tonight, it doesn't mean this is going to happen. So when you go back to your friends, you know, say, like, oh my God, have you seen what they're gonna do? On it's no, this is just some guy standing up here saying, what if, okay? Uh, we're looking at it, but in the end, you and the city council and the planning commission, they're the ones who are gonna decide this stuff. They haven't, we haven't asked them permission to show you any of these slides, right? We just do it, and then if we didn't do it right, they probably will let us know. And um, so, the, um, so you've got right now this kind of six lanes of road, three each way, and then you've got some left turn lanes. And, you know, there's a possibility for maybe adding, shrinking the lanes a little teeny bit, a couple feet, and, because they're very wide, and getting some more bike lane. But there's also ideas about maybe you could make a, take a lane off each way. We talked about that road diet. What would that do? So we're going to look at that. We don't know if it'll work. We don't know if it'll solve part of the problem. We don't know how we'll solve the inter This is all part of what our, our task is, right? Uh, and if in the end it doesn't work to do that, we won't do it. We won't suggest it. Next. We also want to look at Golden Springs. Probably less um, dramatic in terms of what we're going to look at, but still making it a, a pleasant street to both walk and to bicycle. Next. We're also looking at other things that we could do. And on the wall right there, this map, is this, this drawing. And at the end of this, when I, we do this thing with uh, post-it notes I'm going to ask you to do, um, there's some questions here, such as, what opportunities and activities would you enjoy in the new downtown? What kind of spaces do you want to see as the downtown is developed. And then there are examples, pocket parks and plazas and law gathering lawns and nature trails, right? So there's another map over here. Locate the places you go to frequently or ways that you can think things can be improved. So you get to draw post-it, you know, put post-it notes up here and, or put arrows or whatever. You can draw on these if you want. It's fine. I mean, like, give room for somebody else, but don't, don't feel shy about it. So these are questions for you, right? Because we take all this information and it's like going into this neat grinder of a design thing and stuff comes out. Next. So yeah, that's what we just talked about, that locate the places. Okay, yeah, go to the next. Okay, so let me talk about one other thing. This is what we call the program. What's the stuff that's gonna be here? Like, how much? It's gonna be housing? Well, yeah, the town center general plan, the general plan for the town center calls for roughly 900 units here, 900 residential units. The market study we just had done, which is, this means what is there a market for, suggests more than that, upwards of 2,000 units. Now, what's, what about that? What's the difference there? So we don't know. We don't know what the right answer is here at this point. What we know is that we've heard from every, most of the property owners who are interested in doing something that the densities that have been provided in the general plan aren't sufficient to get them to do anything. Let's think about this. They have businesses, they have tenants, they operate whatever. They're making money. So for them to do something different, because this is all land owned by private entities, you've gotta, there's got to be enough of a reason for them to do it. And right now what they're telling us is there's an insufficient um, motivation based on the number 900 units overall. 
that doesn't work for anybody. So that's something to keep in mind. Which means if we just leave it at that, there's a reasonably good chance that nothing will happen, which would be a shame. So then the question becomes, well, what is the number? And, and that's what we don't know. But we know that there's a market for this. We know that a year or so, or two years ago, year and a half after you did the general plan, the city got the Urban Land Institute to come in and uh, to make some recommendations. And that's a professional trade group of developers and planners and architects. And it's a very well-respected organization. And they made recommendations that increased the density to around, I want to say, 1,300 units, was it? So went from 9 to 1,300. So OK, and what we're suggesting is probably might want to be more than that. So and there are two reasons for that. One is to, get, to motivate the individual landowners. B, because in order to make a town center that is truly walkable and has enough vitality and businesses, you need enough people living there to support some of the daily things that go on. And three, because the city needs to meet certain requirements of the state for affordable housing. In order to get the affordable housing, you need enough market rate housing to help pay for the affordable housing. One subsidizes the other. So without enough, you just don't get enough. So I don't have an answer to you. We don't have a number. I'm just letting you know that's something we're thinking about. Right, so they, right now, in addition to the 900 units, there's a, there's a zoning diagram or density of 20 units per acre. And to give you an idea what 20 units per acre is, it's roughly townhouses. That's 20 units an acre-ish, right? So they don't expect all of it to be on their property, but they expect they will have enough of an opportunity to do something that, you know, is worth doing. Yeah. For housing instead, or both. Okay, but that's a great question. So, if we were to go to two million, I mean two million, to to, to two thousand units, like I just showed you, we'd be somewhere around forty units an acre overall. But the reality is that not all of the properties will redevelop because they're too small, or they're awkward, or whatever, or they've got businesses that are going to be there for a long time. So you're really talking more than that on the remaining ones. What that number is, again, who knows? And we don't know if 2,000 is the right number. It's just out there. Um, and, and that, you can see, it's mar broken down by market rate, by affordable, by for sale, by senior. So there's, there's a whole different types of things. Retail. This recommends 446,300 square feet of retail. Right now. Guess how many square feet of retail are operating today? 446,159 square feet. All right, that's how many. So they, they're basically recommending exactly the same retail number. There's actually about a half million square feet of built space there, but about 50,000 of it is not occupied. Now, you might say, why is it so much? Why is it so little? I don't know. And why is it? I mean, I, I, I'm not a market analyst, so I don't know how they come up with that exactly. But I can tell you that it's not surprising that the number, the amount of retail is not proposed as to be increased because retail is no longer the thing that it once was. They're just how many of you go to, you know, clothing stores or shoe stores? And maybe you probably do some, but I, mean, I don't think I've been to a clothing store in four years. I mean, how much is bought online? What do we do in retail environments? Well, we go to restaurants, we get coffee, probably go to some CVS, and we go to the grocery store. We had some other things we do as well. And, but we don't necessarily go to the old, it's not the old-fashioned retail that it once was. Food and beverage is big. Now we've got a hospital going in there. The hospitals are one of the new retailers, actually, weirdly enough. It's not retail like you buy stuff, but all right, you've got uh, retail as in 
it's in a retail space, and you go there for services, that, and that's what you've got coming in now. So that number, 446, basically says status quo on the amount of retail, though not status quo on the type of retail. It does imagine, I'll get, one second, it does imagine changing the retail mix because this is a way better demographic than is being serviced by the retail. Way better meaning more money. This is a, this community skews uh, a older and wealthier than the region. But its offerings, its retail offerings do not reflect that. So that means there's an opportunity. I'm sorry, yes ma'am. Actually, the market study did suggest movie theaters. I, I have my doubts because I don't know that there's so, I mean, the number two movie theater chain just declared bankruptcy. So um, I, I don't, I personally, my gut tells me it's a tough thing to bank on. Um, I mean, it's not that I'm against them. I just don't know that, you know, how many of them are going to be needed. But um, but that is in the that is one of the suggested uh, things. There are, there are other things that are replacing movie theaters, though, like gaming centers, gaming theaters. Video this is video game stuff. Uh, you know, I don't know how many of you have gone to one of these. <laughs> I haven't, but my kids have, and these are places where you go and you watch other people game which sounds incredibly boring to me, but apparently people really like it. And these are like movie theaters. Like, they go for this stuff, and they sit, they see these big screens, and they order drinks, and they order, you know, whatever. They, it's a thing. So you could imagine something like that. Um, so or there's other, other stuff out there as well. Um, the, what are you, VR center, virtual reality places. That's another one that's big. You run around with glasses and you do stuff. Yeah. Um, there's something I don't understand about this chart. You know, I don't think it's we just work with it. But that one part which says affordable apartments and then senior housing. Affordable housing over there, it lists a thousand two hundred twenty five per month. But senior housing is over four thousand. This is not affordable. This is this is this is market rate senior. That's not affordable. This is this this is there is a market for this in Diamond Bar right now. Seniors who will pay 4000 a month for housing in this town center. That's what this is saying. I will tell you, the demographics here are surprising. Maybe not surprising. There is, well, but yes, there are. And some of those might be unaffordable, but this is another market set. These are people who choose to sell their home because they just don't want to deal with a house anymore and move into an apartment where... Maybe for three months of the year, they go somewhere else, they close it up, they've, you know, I mean, that exists. And apparently, there's a market for it here. Uh, so, and that group is an especially, it's only 180, it's not gonna make a big difference. But that group goes out to dinner a lot. So, it's a good group. Um, I'm, I mean, just, that's like the real thing. I, but, I mean, I can't back it up because I didn't do the study, but. You know, it's not that many units here, but it's it's not affordable senior. It's just market rate senior. All right, okay, that's my that, that was my question. Yeah, next. So what kind of housing could that be? Well, it could be everything from row houses and townhouses to live-work units where you can, like, live above the place where you work, right, uh, to courtyard housing to just apartment buildings. So probably not any anything more than one of the things we heard from the community month ago was no more than either three, four, or five stories. It depended on who you, some people said no more than three, some said no more than four, some said no more than five. Yes? Yeah. Don't, it's a good question. Uh, how much more water is gonna be used? The, the, one of the things about any development that goes on here is that the development itself does not produce the people. The people are already here, and they're d demanding. So if, 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 if you have a grown kid that's living with you, when they move to an apartment here, they're not going to actually use any more water than they were using. They're just using it in a different place. So 
people often equate more housing with more water use, and it doesn't have to be. The second thing is that the, the biggest use of water in residential development is in landscape. And if you convert the landscaping irrigation for, to gray water, you don't use that much. With high efficiency toilets, sinks, and showers, you know, we can do a pretty, pretty good amount of development here and have no impact whatsoever on water consumption in this area. So I would say that, and we're really talking at the most, maximum 2,000 units, but could be 900 units. That's what the general plan already says. So, yeah. I was on another committee years ago, and we talked about this water issue. And, you know, most of these issues around here have the water going up. So, but I know things like the Diamond Bar Golf Course and some other things, they use root stream water. Yes. All the plants. Right. And I know she didn't mention that at all, and I know this lady brought up a good point about water. Sure. But I would think that all that community, no matter what it is, should be 100% replanted just by getting the pipe down. Sure. Yeah, so if the pipe exists, that's great. I mean, that's cheaper than using the gray water from the buildings. Absolutely. But you still have to have fresh potable water for, you know, what you drink and all of that. Right, for landscaping, yeah. And I think that's, that's uh, something we can easily meet, and that's the biggest challenge. And I, I didn't know about the purple. We call it purple pipe because they, they make all the pipes purple. That's, that's just a thing. And so um, uh, that's great. If they have that, then easy, easy peasy. Um, the other thing that's, by the way, good about this is, you know, all of that water that, when it does rain, six days of the year that it rains, you know, it rains a lot, right, those six days. And it, what's it do? It sits on, it drops on the, the, the surface, the parking lots, right? And then it runs into wherever it runs into. And it picks up every chemical known to humankind that isn't good. Because cars leach all kinds of bad things onto the ground, including something called molybdenum which is incredibly toxic, it comes from the tires. So when you do this kind of redevelopment, you also have the opportunity for stormwater recharge. You can take the water and bring it into areas that are planted, go into the ground, and either get filtered there and then out to the storm system, or go straight into the ground itself, depending on how you do it. So you actually have the opportunity of cleaning up the water that does fall here uh, by doing this development. Now, you're not going to use that water for irrigation because there's not enough of it, but it's still something that's good to do next. So that's kind of the primarily the end of the talk and a couple postscript slides. We're here all week. This was the schedule. You've seen it on the website. Tomorrow will be, I know it's hard to see, but if you go on the website, downtown4db.com. Number four, not F-O-R. U, F O U R, or F O R. It's four. So downtown4db.com, and it includes the schedule for this event. It's a great opportunity for also to put comments in, et cetera, et cetera. We have qu time for questions and answers now, too. But, and then next, we're, we're going to be working. And so, like, for example, this is a model we're working on right now. This is existing conditions along Diamond Bar Boulevard. We're going to be doing experiments here on what it could look like you know, another way. This is what it is today. This is digital. I mean, it's not real, but okay. Next. We're going to be drawing. This is already, we got sketches. Remember, I talked about stairs. Look, a stair. So imagine that little dinky stair you saw. Where is it? I never saw that stair. Well, you'd see this stair. And, uh, you know, this is like some public place in the middle, like La, Las Ramblas in, uh, in Barcelona housing along it with retail, some civic building at the end, views of the mountains. So this man, Chaiwat, in the back, he just did this today in like three hours. He just does this stuff. Um, and, um, you know, if you come back tomorrow, you'll see more stuff. So, and we do these kind of weird sketches, which will eventually become plans of, of places, right? This is just the beginning of stuff. So that's what we're doing. Uh, and now we can have Q&A. And or you can get up. If you have to leave, I wouldn't be insulted if you took some post-it notes from the back and put them up here. As, you were, as we're doing Q&A, you could be walking around writing, putting post-it notes with notes that you have, comments. Maybe you don't want to ask me publicly. You don't want to say something, but you really hate something. <laughs> but you're too polite to say it. 
then you could just write it on a post-it note, and, you know, do that, or make arrows or whatever. So I think, is that it? Is that the last slide? Yep. Okay, good. So we can turn the lights on, too. Can I ask you if these slides, thank you, good evening. Are the slides going to be available at DB4, yeah, at the no, website? Well, Greg, can, I mean, can we get the, is it okay? Can we put the slides up? Can we get these up? Yes, they will be up. I don't know exactly when date, but they will be up soon. Slides will be up there. But they won't have me explaining them, so. Yeah. Yes, sir. He's actually my brother, so you have to discount. <laughs> Some of this, but thanks. And I got a nice dinner out of it too. <laughs> <laughs> so, but what I would like to would like to to offer and have you talk about a little bit, please, is when we talk about possibly two thousand units here, that what we're talking about is if you put the units here, you don't carve up our open spaces. And so part of the balance that he's working on is trying to balance our ability to keep our open spaces and put our houses where people want, can actually live and walk and stay off the streets. Yeah, thank you. That's Well, so I don't know if you remember that drawing I said early where they had the sprawling kind of green area, it was sort of a suburban area, and then it had the, what could happen if you filled it all in. And it was, I said it was like from back east because you could tell it was all green. So what we did, it was, a, it, was a, it was a similar kind of place that we were working with. It's actually the suburbs of Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, where the University of Virginia is. And we were able to put in, I forgot how many, like 5,000 units and not use one extra square foot of raw land. Okay, now that was really important because the concern was that we're turning the entire this incredible, beautiful pastoral landscape into sprawl. And so that was the, the challenge there. So those, whatever, 900 units, 1,500 units, 2,000 units, they will use, definitely use less water if they are here than if they were in single family homes, you know, in the next town over or unincorporated LA County or unincorporated San Bernardino County. So that's something that we have to consider as well. Uh, yes? Um, other than the certified mail letter from Topsoil, the last one you sent, have there been any other attempts of maybe a private investigator? Something that most states have to get them all rolling quicker? Well, um, I'm, I'm not aware of that. Um, <laughs> actually, we, we have made some other. So we realize, of course, that the tenants pay their rent to somebody. And um, so that's usually a property manager. So then we go through the property manager, and we've now talked to several property managers, and we've said, look, we know you don't control the, you're just the property manager, we get that. But it's in your client's interest to talk to us because we could make them a lot of money. Um, yeah, so. So yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna, we're not giving up. So I we all know there's like four drive-through restaurants there. There's four gas stations, and they probably aren't one of the ones who are saying bring in more people or housing. They probably don't care, right? No, they actually love it. <laughs> they just don't want to. They they're happy doing what they do. Right. I mean, the McDonald's, we talked to the McDonald's, which, by the way, just so that you know, that McDonald's, I don't know how it, the actual revenue, but in terms of number of trips, it is the single highest trip generator of any business in the area. Okay? I mean, by far. CVS is number two, but like by a lot different. Now, I mention that because when we talk about traffic and all that, part of the reason that there's a lot of traffic is because you have a McDonald's that has majority of its business in drive-through, yeah. like vast majority in drive-through. So, and they, they love the fact that more people will come 
just don't mess with them. But they're, yeah, that's what it, <laughs> and that's probably the same with the, the gas All of stations. Them. The well. gas stations totally love it. So you got to work around them. Yep. And they're, yes. they're not going to fight you, but they're not going to give up any land or modify anything. No, no, no. They, they're not giving up anything. They're not changing anything. So it is what it is. You know, we're not going to, the enemy of the good is the perfect. If, what is it? Isn't that right? How it goes? The perfect is the enemy of the good. Yeah. So we're going to try as good or better as we can, but we know it's not going to be perfect. Yeah. Well, I think that that's probably a big challenge when you look at the the habit and the other, the T and whatever thing yeah. there. Their drive through is either out or in the main thoroughfare there. Right. right? The habit I think yeah. is the number three one. I think what's it called? The burger habit or something? No, just habit, it's yeah, the, the habit. The, the habit. Burger. So there, I think it was it was McDonald's, then CVS, but by like a lot different, and yeah. then. Habit was and the then third. the 76 station. All of those use yeah, that I shopping don't, center. The rest are like out. much less. Yeah, but they take up that space, and they're, if they're not going to give it up, that oh, right. really impacts. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, it, you know, that is what it is. Uh, there are a few tools that the city might have long term in terms of the zoning and all that can encourage their redevelopment in the long term because if they want to do improvements or whatever, then they can run into things. So I, again, we're going to focus on the possible, yeah. which is by itself not like easy. <laughs> but so I'm not saying we're doing in the easy. We're doing on the possible. So is there because uh, of 23 different landowners and some of them you haven't been found yet? That's not a normal job of company as yourself, right? No, it's not normal. But we promised the city we would do it. The city's helping us, right? But is the so this is a question I guess for the city as well is. Is there going to be some company that can, can you know, they're going to have to interface with you and so forth and, and the, the city, but that's a big thing. I've been on some projects where just third-party people and you built shells, and it becomes really a chess game to figure out how to do that. And that could, yeah, it, it, it's kind of the weak link, right? Sure. I will tell you that every project we've worked on ever has this problem. There's always sites that we can't find the, it's just normal. Yeah. And um, so that's number one. One of the things about a specific plan, that's just what we're doing here, it's called a specific plan. And that doesn't, that specific plan with a capital S, capital P. So it doesn't mean that it's very specific, actually. It's a weird name. <laughs> it doesn't have to be that specific. But it's a zoning ordinance. It's a special zoning ordinance that applies to this particular area. So the big power that the city has is in the zoning. Because zone, I mean, zoning is a very powerful tool. Now, you can't take away rights, but you can uh, require, th if, if in redevelopment, you have certain expectations. If you want to do X, then we want you to do Y. So that's a lot of authority and power. And over time, that's how things will change. Thanks. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, you were talking about the, the sta uh, staircase and yeah. so forth. Um, oh, sure. Thank you. Uh, you were talking about the staircases, and I was wondering, in those designs, is there thought in terms of the staircase and a ramp integ integrated so that it could be more inclusive sure. for families and communities? Well, we, 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 first of all, that's the law. So we would have to be able to provide accessibility on that staircase. So it's not even an option. It's, it is a requirement. There are many ways to do that. It can be with ramps. It can be with elevators. It can be a combination of the two. That's a design detail that we're not ready for yet. Uh, but yes, any place where you have people moving up and down stairs, you have to provide multiple ways of doing that. So it is, yes, yes. Are they gonna like knock down the sprouts and the CVS and all that to like make the new stuff? How, what grade are you in? <laughs> I'm in eighth grade. In eighth grade? Do you like urban design stuff? Do you like this stuff? Is that interesting to you? Yeah, I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, good. Because we need more women doing this stuff. <laughs> so that's good. Thank you for asking the question. The question was, are they going to knock down the sprouts and all that to do this? Not at any time soon. 
But eventually it could happen, sure. But you'll, be, you'll have grandkids by then? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. You might not have grandkids by then. But, but it, I'm going to guess you'll be in college by then. Okay, it's going to be a while. I mean, Sprouts has a, has a lease, so they, they've signed a lease with the owner, which, you know, they're going to be there. So if they were to get knocked down at some point, and this would be up to the owner of the property to decide to do that, the owner would work with the Sprouts and either buy their lease out or they would figure out a way to include Sprouts in the new development. So it could still be a Sprouts, but it would look different but have all your favorite products. Yes. Hey, Bill, sir. You know, this, this young lady brings up a very good point. She's very perceptive. When I was a, a child, a young boy, I grew up in a community, a very old community, and then urban renewal came in, then gentrification came in, and there was nothing left to go back to something. Sure. Diamond Bar, I've, I've been a resident for almost 30 years in this community, housing, townhomes, whatever. And one thing that we have, we go back to, you know, open areas with cows, with all kinds of branches and stuff. But one thing that this that I don't see in this any of these drawings is a focus. And the focus that I would perceive is way up on the mountains there, and up on the uh, Diamond Bar Boulevard, is the windmill. That's the last thing that we have in history of Diamond Bar. I would love to see the Diamond Bar windmill come back as a focus to this area with the walkable areas, with the trees, you know, with limited parking like you see in Monrovia or Glendora, sure. any of those places, little ice cream places, you know, you can buy some ice cream and you can sit with some trees and look at the, and look at the windmill. Maybe even have some potable water coming there or whatever. But the windmill with its site can be seen from the freeway in that, in that sure. section there. Up there you can't see it. And the history of Diamond Bar is wasted up there, as I'm, I'm concerned. I, I think that's a great point, sir. I, it's got to come back to the focus, like this gentleman did right there at the very end there with the, yeah. you see, or maybe the close by there. Yeah. The windmill has to be as the focus, because that's the only thing that we have here to remember of its past. Sure. Well, that's an interesting thought, and I'm going to go look at this windmill. Because I don't know it. Know where it is. I don't know this windmill, but I, um, and that's how we do these meetings because all kinds of stuff comes out that I never knew about. And, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, that's cool. So um, let's, we'll take a look. There's a plaque there. I, I, I'm sure there is. So <laughs> I'm going to go find it. Like the stairs. Yeah, no, we're going we're gonna to look at that. That would be very cool. But it should be a focus. That's what I mean. I, I hear you. Okay. Well, there you go. Um, thank you for that. Um, any other questions? Yes. Cities that have this done successfully. Well, I mean, Chino Hills has sort of done this. Brea has sort of done this. Each of those is a little less ambitious than we're trying to do here, but they certainly have done some of this. There's a lot of this work has been done around the area. Uh, it's happening in places in Orange County. Uh, we're doing a little bit of this kind of work in um, Montclair right now, also in Claremont, uh, south of the tracks. So uh, this kind of thing is we're aware of, and. You know, uh, what makes this so unusual is the 23 landowners. Usually we don't have that. So that makes this a little bit more of a challenge. Might I suggest downtown Baldwin Park off of Ramona Boulevard. They've okay. incorporated a four-story um, unit full cool. of um, different housing right next to the police department with a lot of businesses sure. and a lot of walkable areas. Okay. That's great. Okay. We'll do it. I mean, we actually looked recently at the downtown Pomona. There have been some new uh, things there that are actually quite nice. Uh, Santa Ana has actually done some very nice things in its downtown. Uh, so we've been looking at this. But those are all places that already have a kind of grid, and they're filling in. So this one is Chino Hills and, and, and Brea are two that are interesting to us because they are kind of more like this. Um, so yeah. Yes, ma'am, did you have another? I thought you did. Uh, 
Charles, and then there's, uh, I guess it's Basil and Company now, is that what it's called? Does that go down as far as that, that land yeah. down there? Yes. I don't know where Continental was, but oh. is that it's a tire a store? Company. Brown, Rice. Brown Rice. Oh, okay, that, yeah. yeah. It goes down that far? Yeah. Up to the edge of the freeway, up to the edge of the 60. Oh. Yes, ma'am. I'm all the way in the back, but uh, sorry I'm walking late. But I have a question. Perhaps I probably have missed the program. But is there any financial incentives for the property owners? Because it's a huge investment for them to convert into something that the, the city has a vision of. So is there any financial incentives? And obviously I could see that it will resolve quite a few um, housing issues. Well, the incentive is to make a lot of money. Indeed. So, um, and we think that if you rezone this land so that they can, in effect, create whatever that density number is, that's a pretty big incentive. Right. But so, then the startup capital. How well, that's what any developer has that issue. I mean, developers, that's what they do. That's what they bring to bear. They identify the capital. So the, the owner of the two pale yellow properties uh, on that map. Here, here. They understand where their capital comes from. I've talked to these folks. They're doing some big development. The owner of this land here, they understand. I mean, these folks want, they basically said, give us X amount of units per acre and, you know, don't bother us and we'll, like, we're going to bother them, but. But um, but they will definitely. That's an incentive. Doing that, you know, doing that kind of increased density, they can figure out where their capital comes from. They're good at that. Okay, I hope so because uh, of course, if for like smaller property owner, they may have difficult time because it, it all really contingent to so all the development moving. One of our thoughts is that this is where the part becomes interesting. And I'm going to just use this as an example because I, you know, I don't speak for any particular property owner. But see, this smaller property owner and this slightly bigger property owner, if they could work with this property owner in either a joint venture or an, an ownership partnership or even just selling outright, whatever, most of them don't want to sell, but maybe they could partner, all of a sudden you have the possibility for something bigger and you let those folks who know what they're doing in this thing, because they do this all the time, do the whole thing, and they take a piece of that. That's the theory, anyway. Whether, I mean, they'd have to structure their own deal, but that's how it generally would work. Yeah, but so, again, the, I mean, there are people who are sentimental and probably wanted to keep the way it yeah. is. And the, the owners of this property, they're not so sentimental. <laughs> you, okay. <laughs> <laughs> they're not, I mean, they would like to make more money. All right, it's, you know, having said that, they're, they're making money now, so they need, so there has to be, an, you're right, there has to be enough of an incentive for them to do something different. So if I'm, you know, if somebody's paying me $100 a week for basically nothing, and you say, well, I'm going to, you can make $125 a week, but, you know, you got to do all this stuff. You say, fine, I'm good with the 100 you know, I don't need to. But if they say $400 a week, well, then maybe it's worth it. So... Any other? Yes, ma'am. Um, can you share in regards to the design process and what uh, to expect if we come for the rest of the week? It's a messy process. It's going to be a lot of tracing paper uh, on the walls. I'm going to be asking you for comments. We're going to be talking about things we're playing with, experimenting. Um, it's a little bit like you know, making, watching sausage made, except it's okay for vegetarians to do this. And uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a little messy because it's, it's not pure. It's not like we just sit down and it comes out. 
and there's going to be different strategies that are going to be drawn on tracing paper or on this kind of paper and put up on the wall. We're going to talk about it, and it's going to people are going to comment. And they're going to say, I like this, I don't like this, you should go look at this thing that's over there, because it would be perfect over here. And that's what it's going to be like. And at the end, and on Wednesday, we're going to have two or three different ideas, I hope. And we're going to talk about them, and which do you like, and whatever. And then we're going to take that and merge it into one. And at the end of the week, we're going to have essentially an idea. It's not going to be the final product. It's like the end of the week, I'm going to say it's the end of the beginning. So this is the very beginning of the beginning. Then we're going to be at the end of the beginning at the end of the week. And then we have to like make it all work after that. So I don't know if that answers your question because it's not simple. It's a messy process. It's a fun process, though. Yes? I didn't know about your previous uh, presentation, but just I just have a question re regarding the parking. Is the parking or share parking, or they concentrate at a certain location and feed to the development, or how does that work in general? Well, we haven't designed it yet, so we don't exactly know, but the general rule of thumb would be a, what we call a park once strategy, which means there's some sort of shared pool of parking, and everybody gets to use it or you know maybe there's more than one of those we like to think of parking like a utility so you know you buy electricity from a provider who provides electricity you don't like generate well if you have solar panels you do but even that might go into the grid so a lot of cases you're just buying electricity from the grid and it's being created and you're pick, taking a little piece of it or water you're, you're buying a little piece of it when you turn your fountain on you turn your tap on well, think of parking in kind of the same way. Like, there's this parking, and you're going to go in and use it, and it's being provided by some entity. Now, typically, that can be done either by the developer themselves or by some sort of centralized authority. It could be a property owner association. It could be a city parking authority, a municipal parking authority that's paid into by the property owners. There are a lot of ways to finance that. We're, you know, that's going to be way down. We're not ready to get there yet. But yes, generally speaking, you would have more centralized parking, and you would go park once, and then you'd go to what you wanted to go to. Thank you. Any other? Yes. As soon as possible. Uh, I mean, it, it, I don't know that we've gotten to that level of detail. Um, and again, it, it's, you know, we're going to go through this process, hopefully be finished by next summer, end of the summer, and a year from now, you know, with approvals and all that. Uh, then it gets, it becomes, in a sense, the law, so to speak. It's a zoning ordinance. At that point, depending on any other infrastructure that, depending on what's in the plan, if there are any sort of infrastructure needs and the city will, and, and, the, and any of them fall on the city, the city will have to decide how it wants to go about that. And then individual developers will do their thing. Right now, we know of two developers today who would like to start tomorrow. They're both on hold because they're waiting for this process to go through. Um, so we know there's interest. Other? So, oh, okay. So have you guys done a uh, traffic study? Because we have, we actually. The and uh, we have, the, it's, not, it's not, we're still tweaking it I mean, in terms of making sure we've got everything understood. And I mentioned this earlier. So what's interesting is that um, you do not have a capacity issue here. You have an intersection problem here. Yeah, but it's right next to the freeway. So yeah, that's the, the on -ramp, worst on -ramp. one. And then the other one is Golden Springs Drive at, at Diamond Bar. Those two intersections are problematic at certain times of the day. But you do not have a, tr have a capacity problem at all. In fact, you have excess capacity on the bulk of Diamond Bar Boulevard. It might, probably doesn't seem like it, but it, it actually is 
it, it's true. So, and I mentioned, one of the things you have to realize is that you may not get the perfect intersection here. In fact, you won't. You won't. So the question's always going to be, what are you willing, what level of compromise are you willing to make between the performance of your intersections and the quality of your pedestrian and public space environment? And that's, that's a question that you as the community, your planning commission, your city council, you don't have to wrestle with that. Right? We'll, we'll certainly make our recommendations, but I've known many a community that have accepted intersections that have a level of service that some people would think are unacceptable. But they've accepted them because what they get out of that is an amazing pedestrian environment. And one of the things that I always, and this is the case here, one of the things that we're noticing here is that a lot of the traffic here is not that local. It's coming distances. Because of the, the freeway being congested and so, so there's plenty of overflow. So one of the things that you have to ask is do you, want be a, do you want the town center of Diamond Bar to be a place you go through or a place you go to? Those are different things, right? And if it's a place you go through, you're going to have, that's an issue because it's going to be hard to get all that through. But it's a place you go to, you're going to accept certain performance that is, let's say, less good for the overall. And, and the question is, if somebody is cutting through Diamond Bar to get somewhere else, you could say, do you care if they have to wait longer? It's not my problem. They should find another route. I mean, I, it sounds, I know it sounds a little glib, Cocky. But, <laughs> and, and it does. But you as a community have certain rights to be able to say that. It's not just, you don't have to just accept it is the way it is because it is that way. All right? I mean, these are decisions that are made. And many of them are political decisions. They're not technical. Just because some traffic engineer said something doesn't mean it's the truth. I mean, it's the truth in his or her view, but doesn't mean it has to be the way they said. So. Our job is to, in a sense, reveal those to you, the community, but the community ultimately has to make that decision on how you want to act on them. So, what's the positive trade-off, so yeah. Okay, so I think everybody's kind of leaving and getting up, so let's call it an evening. Thank you, this was great questions. Please write on the walls and things, thank you. Please write on the, not on the walls, but on the, on the drawing. <laughs> Don't write on the walls, that's not good. Um, <laughs>